So we're now going to be getting the um, afternoon sessions for real world evidence workshop number two, uh, session three, and this is going to be looking at, I think what's the beginning of some discussions on bias. So the, the title of this session is Obscuring Intervention Allocation in Trials to Generate Real World Evidence, Who or Why, Who and When, and when just to to level the, the conversation. So when we're talking about obscuring intervention allocation, we're talking about allocation concealment, aka blinding or masking in clinical trials. The goals of the session are to discuss how variability in knowledge of treatment assignment group affects provider and patient adherence and outcomes, potentially study cost and reliability. Our other goals for the session to be talk about uh, suggesting key factors that could affect decisions uh, to obscure intervention allocation, so when to decide whether allocation concealment is the right choice, and to discuss how uh, decision aid that we've proposed uh, lays out key questions and considerations that might help inform current and future studies. And I've got a great group to discuss that with. I'm going to be uh, describing, doing the moderation as well as describing the decision aid initially. Uh, I'm Jonathan Watanabe. I'm the Associate Professor of Clinical Pharmacy at the Skag School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences in the University of California, San Diego, and I'm also the National Academy of Medicine Anniversary Fellow in Pharmacy. Then we're going to be looking at basically a look back using this decision aid to look at trials. So first we'll have John Graham, Head of Value and Evidence at GlaxoSmithKline. Then Orly Vardini, uh, who's at the Minneapolis VA Center for Chronic Disease Outcomes Research, and she's also an Associate Professor of Medicine at the University of Minnesota. And then we've got a great group to, um, for a panel as well as we'll follow up with the Q&A, talking about how this decision aid going forward could apply to future studies. And for that, I'll have Dr. Kathy Critchlow, Vice President for the Center of Observational Research at Amgen, then Dr. Nancy Dreyer, the Chief Scientific Officer of IQVIA, Alex John London, the Clara L. West Professor of Ethics and Philosophy at Carnegie Mellon, and Dr. James P. Smith, Deputy Director of the Division of Metabolism and Endocrinology Products at the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research at the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. So with that, let's show the decision aid. I think we're going to put it up. Can we put it up? Here you all have it, but we were going to try to show it. <laughs> so it's one of the decision aids that begins obscuring intervention allocation and trials to generate real-world evidence, why, who, and how. So initially, we, we do want to level set with, with some assumptions, and that's the starting assumptions for applying this decision aid are the study question is clearly defined, including the decision to be made, as well as decision maker that the study should inform. So that's known up front. The data are of adequate quality to assess eligibility, the key prognostic factors, treatment exposure and outcomes, and that treatments are randomly assigned or by some other method that supports valid inference. So those are the things that we are accepting as truths before we apply the decision aid. So moving quickly through this, how much would the effectiveness or safety of the study treatment vary among providers or care settings? Oh, okay. Oh, I apologize. So what expectations or preferences, let's go way back. So what expectations or preferences providers and patients to be expected to have regarding benefits and adverse effects of the study interventions? So what will they think up front and how will that impact what follows? How might those preferences or expectations influence the intervention uptake or adherence, fidelity or intensity with which an intervention is delivered, and the likelihood that beneficial or adverse effects would be reported or observed? The next consideration is how might those expectations or preferences differ in the settings where trial results will eventually be applied? So getting back to that population of interest question, how might concealing treatment allocation from patients and or providers reduce biases due to preferences or expectations? How might concealing treatment allocation from patients or providers obscure meaningful differences between interventions, that real world piece? And then finally, how might procedures necessary to conceal treatment allocation from patients and or providers impact the acceptability of trial participation to patients and or providers, the cost of the trial, and the risk-benefit ratio of trial participation? So that's what we're 
going to see if we can apply that and see how it works in other studies. So to begin, we'll go to John Graham.